Hi, I'm Stuart McSwain. I'm Australian distance runner. I'm from King Island. You're listening to the Physical Performance Show. And the winner is... Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome back or welcome to the Physical Performance Show brought to you by the Gold Coast Marathon and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. The aim of this show is to educate and inspire you towards the pursuit of your own physical best performance. We do this through interviews featuring some of the world's top physical performers, and also some of the world's preeminent experts in their chosen fields. Each week, we'll bring you a variety of editions from expert editions, interest editions, coaches' corners, and featured performer editions. And on today's episode, I share with you a conversation that I recently had with Australian distance running star Stuart McSwain on this featured performer episode. By way of bio, Stuart McSwain, Melbourne track club athlete, under the tutelage of Nick Badeau, is an athlete on the rise. Stewart is a dual Australian 10,000 metre track champion, having won back-to-back Zatapet Classics. He recently became the second fastest Australian ever across the 5,000 metre distance, clocking a remarkable 1305.23 in a race which actually saw the fourth fastest 5,000 metres run in history. And just prior to this Recording with Stuart McSwain, Stewie Mack, as he's affectionately known, set the Australian indoor 1,500-metre record with a blistering 335.10 at the Birmingham Indoor Grand Prix meet, where he finished third in a stellar field. Stewie boasts PBs of 28.03 on the road for 10Ks and 27.50 for 10,000 metres on the track. Stewie was an Australian representative at the World Cross Country Championships and also in 2018 at the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast where Stewie finished 5th in the 5,000 metres and 11th in the 10,000 metres. On today's episode, you'll share Stewie's highs, lows and the learnings from his remarkable career to date. So here is my conversation with this week's featured performer, Stewie Mack. Stuart McSween, this is a real treat. Uh, you have been on a meteoric rise with some great PBs of late and really capturing the attention of not just the Australian running community, but also internationally. So uh, welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Hi, Brad. Thanks for having me. Stu, let's start with something a little bit fun, and that's what's one thing that Stewie McSween is learning at the moment? Yeah, I'd say maybe something I'm learning is trying to balance um running with also trying to do uni but the thing i'm trying to learn the most trying to find time for uni sometimes you can prioritize um running a little bit too much so trying to find that balance is probably the thing i'm learning the most at the moment Stu, on that you're in a teaching degree i believe you're in your you know final stages of uh secondary school teaching yep so yeah i'm pretty much three quarters of the way through so hopefully I just over a year left which is won't be bad when I'm finished, which will be good. And your initial love, I believe, was podiatry. Uh, so, yeah, I did two years of podiatry, but then I kind of had to put it on hold um, just when I started traveling overseas just because I couldn't attend um, all the classes. So I might one day go back, but, yeah, I'm pretty happy doing teaching at the moment. Stu, we talk on this show about highs, lows, and learnings. That's the three broad themes for the Physical Performance Show. Uh, before we talk about highs, can you just take us back to how you got into the sport of running and what led you into it? Yeah, so I pretty much started running when I was 12 back home on King Island. Um, so I was lucky enough to have a PE teacher that kind of noticed that I had a bit of ability. Just He saw me playing footy, um, just running around the school, and he kind of got me involved. So 
I pretty much started there and then, yeah, I kind of developed um, over the next few years when I went to boarding school in Ballarat, um, training under a guy called Rod Griffin. Um, so, yeah, that's where I probably cemented my love that I wanted to focus more on running. And then when I was probably 14 or 15, I decided that I'd probably um, just focus on running and kind of stop playing the other sports. Like I was playing tennis, cricket, footy. So, yeah, that's when I kind of focused more on athletics from that point. And what was the catalyst, uh, Stu, to go from, uh, you know, multi-sport so to speak variety of sports to focus in on running at 15 was there a word that was spoken to you like hey Stu you've really got some talent or was it just something that you were realizing you enjoyed more yeah I think it was kind of an easy choice for me um just because I probably it was definitely the sport I was best at so I kind of like with footy and stuff you'd pick up a few injuries and stuff which would obviously hinder training and stuff so I kind of yeah decided I was going to focus on it a little bit um more because yeah just it was probably the sport I was best at out of the three or four I did play and were you showing, you know, promising signs at that stage? Like, were you state championship uh, level or nationals? You know, how were you going as a junior? Yeah, so I was always in juniors. I was, I think there was only one year I didn't make nationals, but I was relatively competitive. Like, I'd always be around the top 10, but there wasn't many times I'd win any of the big national races. I barely medaled at nationals. I was lucky if I could jag a, um, a cheeky, cheeky medal at state level. So I was reasonably good, but I wouldn't say I was, yeah, definitely not an outstanding junior. And, you know, that's, I find there's either two schools. Either you've, you've dominated in juniors and you go into opens dominating or, you know, you've built up your athletic prowess over the junior years. Um, just going back, though, King Island, Stu, uh, to put listeners in perspective, both domestic here in Australia and, and abroad internationally, it's not a big community. Can you put a little bit of a, a description around King Island and what it was like and the population, et cetera? Yeah, so it's a pretty small place. I think the population these days is about 1,500 people. So you do know most of the people um, there. Um, so I was lucky enough to grow up on my family farm. So we've got Merino sheep and Angus beef cattle. Um, and we've still actually got that farm. So I get to go home in holidays and train down there, which is always nice. Um, but, yeah, living on King Island is a pretty good um, upbringing just because the island's not that big. I think it's 64 kilometres up and 32 across. So you've got – all the beaches surrounding you, um, great farmland. So, yeah, I don't think at all the places I've been, I've travelled around the world, there's not many better places than King Island, that's for sure. Uh, hometown patri- patriotism. And that's uh, uh, Tasmania, right? Yeah, so it's like it's halfway between Victoria and Tasmania, but it's um, yeah classified as Tassie, which is obviously good. So you, you, you're forever King Island's greatest running export. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think we've had many other runners at all. So, yeah, I, I'll probably be pretty close. That's brilliant. And and Stu, uh, you know, as a junior, who were the runners that you were aspiring to be like, you know, when you first made that focused effort to, to focus on your running? Was there anyone that really captivated your imagination? or? Yeah, so I'd say the two guys that definitely stand out was um, Brett Robertson, who obviously still runs now, Olympic finalist. So um, he was a guy that I followed from when I was pretty young and I was lucky enough to become mates with him um, when I went to World Junior Cross in 2013. So he's probably a guy that I've looked up to the most over those years, but also being a Ballarat boy, um, I looked up to a guy, Collis Birmingham, um, who's from Ballarat. Um, I remember seeing him when I was a little kid at the track when I was 14, 15, seeing him train probably 2012, 2013 years when he was absolutely flying and just seeing how unbelievably fast he was and thinking how the guys run that fast. So I'd say, yeah, definitely Collis and Brett are probably two guys that I've looked up to um, in my career so far. And, and I mean, moving to Ballarat, it's a, been a bit of an Australian distance running mecca, you know, Monaghetti and and variety of other runners over the years. It, it must have been something where you got to observe them that, that helped you, I guess, reconcile what was required to be you know, elite at the top end. Yeah, definitely. I think I was lucky. My school that I boarded at was about uh, played 90 second jog to the lake, which is um, a pretty famous 6K loop in the um, centre of town. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty lucky to be able to have that right where I went to boarding school. And then you obviously see guys like, yeah, Monaghetti, Collis training around the place. And it's kind of pretty motivating when you see some of the, the best guys, not only in Australia, but in the world, um, training where you are to um, try and become more focused in your own running. And and Stu, was there ever a word that one of these, you know, runners that you sort of idolised or you admired, I should say, like Brett Robinson or Collis said to you that really encouraged you? Yeah, especially from a young age, I remember Collis was always um, pretty supportive. Um, he would let me come and train with him when I was probably 15, 16 and just on easy runs. And I'd probably be – some of the runs, he might run for 70 minutes. I'd keep up for the first 15 minutes and finish the run maybe five or ten minutes behind him. But I always remember – 
him being pretty supportive to come back. And if I needed any advice or anything, it was good. Um, and also, yeah, Brett, Brett, um, I remember 2013, I actually it was 2014 season. Just, I went to world junior cross and I pretty much had almost given up the sport. Um, I kind of started first year uni and I thought maybe I wouldn't continue with it, but yeah, Brett got me, got me into keep training. Um, so yeah, he was pretty huge as well, making sure I stayed in the sport once I had left school. And what was it that Brett said? Come on, mate, you got some talent. You can't quit now, or yeah, it was kind of. Um, he just said, "You obviously seem like you enjoy hanging out with the the guys you train with." So he's kind of pretty supportive with me, making sure I keep coming to training. And that's when I kind of found that extra drive to try and see if I could do do a little bit, um, see what I could achieve, and yeah, senior ranks. And uh, and Stu quit in first year uni how close did you really get though was it just something that you uh thought oh, i'm just a bit burnt out or struggling to manage everything or not improving quick enough i mean digging a little bit deeper there i'd made my first australian team the year before in the world junior cross team and i kind of it's a big step up going from juniors to seniors so i think i, I kind of was ready to focus more on just uni i just started podiatry at that stage so I'd probably there's about three weeks where I didn't run um, before I got back into it, where just probably I wasn't progressing as well as I wanted to, and I kind of had to decide whether I was going to try and give running any th- everything or just live the normal life and focus on uni. So there was probably yeah a three week period where I pretty much um, almost called it a day, but I was lucky to have guys like yeah Robbo around me to try and get me back into it. And I think yeah obviously um, based on how it's gone since then, it's paid off pretty big. Absolutely, and uh, and we want to go there. Just before we throw to some of your recent outstanding form and results, uh, did you grow up with brothers or sisters, Stu, on King Island there? Yeah, so I've got an older sister who's about three and a half years older, and then I've got a twin brother as well, So, who's actually, a, he just finished a podiatry degree last year, so he's um he's doing pretty well. And so uh, is there any uh, running genes through your, uh, your sister or your twin brother? Both of them don't run, but... My brother, so I, I get him out to go for easy runs, and you can tell he's definitely got a bit of an engine on him because <laughs> he can definitely, like, pretty much all the easy runs he's in front of me, I can keep up with me. So you can definitely tell he has pretty good genetics for the sport. Stu, uh, going to recent form, you ran the second fastest 5,000 metres ever recorded by an Aussie uh, recently in Brussels, uh, running in August last year, running, sorry, in August 2018, running 13.05. 23 and and that race was blistering the the winner went on to run the fourth record the fourth fastest 5000 meter time ever 1243.02 so Stu just on that performance I believe that was a a huge PB for you of maybe around 14 seconds up from what you ran at the Com Games on the Gold Coast in 2018 so can you take us through a little bit of that and what that race meant to you um yeah so it was a pretty big moment just because it was my first Diamond League final so it's probably as competitive a race as you ever get. Um, it was kind of, I'd run really pretty fast over 3K. I'd run pretty fast over 1,500. And I kind of hadn't nailed the 5K time I thought that I should have been able to run by then. So I was kind of hopeful going into Brussels I could run a big And yeah, to come out and run 13.05 was obviously um, a pretty big moment, especially it was so late in the season to be able to keep my form throughout the whole European season and be able to close it that way. Um, in such a big race was yeah pretty special. And uh, and Stu, you certainly won a lot of uh, Australian accolades for that performance, and, and no doubt grabbed a bit of international attention as well. But I think uh, I've heard you say you were you were clock watching, and you actually took a tumble, and you went from the elation of a uh, a PB, a substantial PB, second fastest five thousand meter ever recorded by an Aussie, behind former guest of the show uh, uh, Craig Mottram. To on the ground with a dislocated shoulder. So what happened and then what followed after? Yeah, I was obviously pretty tired um, running at that pace. Um, and I was in a group of about two other guys and I was trying to trying to go on the outside and sprint sprint round them by also watching the clock because I knew I was close to that pretty magical 13-minute mark. So I was kind of just watched it tick over 13 and I kind of, yeah, forgot to run and kind of clipped my foot on the my spike on the track and, yeah, took a pretty bad tumble crossing the line. So... It kind of went from, yeah, the excitement of running a PB to I was in pretty bad pain for that next 20 minutes when they were trying to um, get my shoulder put back in because I think it took them about eight or nine tries to finally get it in. So, yeah, that, that 20, 25 minutes until they got it in was probably yeah, one of the most painful moments of my life. Is that the first time, Stu, you've dislocated your shoulder? Yeah, it was. So I wasn't sure the process. So it happened and I was like, I thought I might have a break in my elbow because I just couldn't move the whole arm. 
And then I was kind of um, unsure what was going on. And then they're like, oh, you've definitely dislocated your shoulder. So I'm thinking, oh, they'll, it'll be easy. They'll just be able to put it back in in one go. But then, yeah, once it took eight or nine, it wasn't um, it wasn't great because you're just in a lot of pain. And then once they get it back in, you obviously um, start feeling a lot better pretty quick. Yeah, uh, it's a traumatic injury. And, uh, and Stu, you've, you've recovered very well from that to just very recently while whilst overseas record the Australian uh, indoor 1,500-metre record. Uh, so can you take us through? It's 3.35.10. You finished third in the Birmingham Indoor Grand Prix meet there in England. So what has that done for your confidence and your belief, and what did that result mean to you? Yeah, that was um, obviously a pretty big result for me. Um, in the race, the world record was broken, so I kind of got on the pace early. Um, two guys were going off that 3.31 indoor world record. So I kind of hung on for about 950 to a K of the race and then found the last 500 pretty tough once those two guys got away. But, yeah, obviously to break um, the indoor record was pretty special and to break a guy I trained with who is obviously a world-class athlete, Olympic finalist, Ryan Gregson, was a special moment. Um, but, yeah, it was um, probably, probably – you never know when you're going to be in a kind of race where world records broke. So – it was pretty um, crazy circumstances to be in, really. What time did you loop through that first 1,000 metres in? It was just under 2.23. So it was either 2.22 high or two, maybe 2.23. So, yeah, they were definitely – I think the leaders went through in about 2.22 flat. So I think, yeah, they were definitely moving. <laughs> Unbelievable. And uh, at the end of that, did any of these guys – because there's only two in front, and I believe the pedigree of those those athletes is quite remarkable. I think – the guy that obviously got the world record's the fastest ever now, and the other guy's third. And the guy's record they broke, Hisham El is arguably one of the greatest um, ever, probably the greatest middle distance runner. So it just shows how too good those two guys were um, when they, um, yeah, they re- completed the race in Birmingham. And did any of these uh, these guys, you know, comment to you in any way, or they just leave you to your own devices after the race? Um, yeah, kind of. Everyone goes their separate ways. Um, Especially the guy that broke the world record. I think he did a couple of lap celebrations. So you don't really see him too much after the race. But you certainly uh, announced to the world that you're a force to be reckoned with. And I, I was amazed at your 1,500 metre speed. I've all, always you know, thought of you as a five and 10,000 metre guy. So is it surprising to you that you, you're getting these sorts of results across the 1,500 metres? It's a little bit surprising, I guess. But I kind of, to be a good 5K, 10K guy, you've got to be pretty good over 15 as well because... They run low 50 last laps in most of the big races, so you've kind of got to be good at um, 1,500. But I think um, I've always felt like I've had a bit more speed than what I've probably um, been able to show in races until last year. So, yeah, I'm definitely looking at running a lot more of the shorter stuff. I think um, it's a lot funner when you're only out there for three and a half, four laps compared to when you're out there for 25 laps. So I'm definitely looking forward to trying to run a lot more 1,500 miles in the next um, 12 months. So uh, taking on the trip will be a difficult task, 1,500 slash mile, 5,000 and 10,000. So uh, I guess you're just going to have to find your way. Yeah, exactly. I think that depending on how the European season goes, I'll try and make the decision what I'm going to focus on um, towards the end of the year leading into world champs. And you're the Australian champion uh, running 27.50 uh, at Zatapec there. So, uh, you know, you're really uh, – you're really announcing yourself as a serious force, Stu. Yeah, I think um, obviously going back to back national 10K was pretty special. I think it shows that I've got pretty good range from 1500 to 10K. Um, a kind of meet like Zatapec, you get a lot of your family and friends there, so you want to make sure you're performing um, pretty well. So you always have a lot of motivation going into those kind of races. Stu, uh, you joined Melbourne Track Club, or when did you first connect with Nick Badeau and the, and the Track Club? Yeah, so it's pretty much. I trained with them a little bit at the end of 2015, but I probably officially joined um, at the start of 2016. So I've um, I've been lucky enough to be training with the group for yeah, a bit of, probably almost three years now. So yeah, I feel pretty privileged to be able to do that. And what's probably the biggest learning you've taken from surrounding yourself in such a, a high performance environment? Yeah, I think beforehand you don't really realise how hard um, guys actually work. Like I think before I joined the group you kind of underestimate how hard guys like Brett Robertson, Ryan Gregson, Collis Birmingham actually work. And the one percent as they do behind the scenes, you think they're just, um, they're just out running. But when you start training them, you realize all the little things they do, like recovery, they're monitoring their diets, um, the gym work. So that's probably the biggest eye opener really when you see, um, see how much work goes behind the scenes. It's not just the running for the um, top guys. 
So prior to joining, you know, surrounding yourself with uh, with the the crew or the team, your perception was that they're just mega talents that do some training, but you've been surprised with what goes into it. Yeah, exactly. I don't think before I joined the group, I'd even touched any any weights. I didn't realize it was probably a thing I needed to do. So seeing those guys, like guys like Greg on stuff, they're tr- doing weight training two or three times a week. You start to realize how hard they actually work. And that's why they're the best because they're willing to go above and beyond what other people are willing to do. And so have you now added strength and conditioning to your weekly program? Yeah, definitely. So I'll normally do it, yeah, two or three times a week as well. And for how many years have you been now doing that, just since Melbourne Track Club days? Yeah, since pretty much I joined the the crew, Nick was like, you've got to get a lot stronger. Um, so, yeah, from from that, I've slowly progressed. I'm still not great, but I'm getting better at those little little one percenters. What makes you say, Stu, you're still not great? Uh, I, I think anyone who's watched me in the gym knows I'm not good. Um, de- probably definitely the worst in the squad, but I – my own personal progress, I'm getting a little bit better each year. So I'm just trying to keep ticking away and hopefully it um, will result in some better um, race results coming up as well. Well, what you're doing seems to be working. So uh, the scoreboard uh, doesn't uh, doesn't lie there. When you say uh, you're getting progressively better, any specific examples, Stu, of what you've uh, classified as a bit of a win in your strength and conditioning? Um, I think the big thing is like when I, when I started, I probably would be lucky – especially with weights, I'd barely have, I pretty much would just start with body weights. Why now I'm at the point where I've, I've developed enough strength and stability to be able to add a lot more free weights on to what I'm doing. So I think um, that it's definitely made a big difference off in the body, only able to train body weight to probably, even though it's not much like when I'm on the, um, when I'm doing squats or something, I might be able to do 50 or 60 kilos now. Why back in 2016, I would have, been lucky to be able to lift the bar yeah so that's a noticeable difference and i mean what's your current body weight Stu? what do you sort of uh, get around at yeah so i'm normally around 72 73 kilos it kind of fluctuates in the off season i might go more towards 75 way in the middle of the european season i'm probably low 70 71 so it's generally around that yeah middle to low 70 kilo mark and Stu, over these recent years where you've been you know hooked in with uh nick Badeau, the melbourne track club on this meteoric rise of, uh, of, of uh, running improvement, what's your injury profile been like? Have you succumbed to many injuries along the way? Yeah, so I've been lucky. I haven't had any uh, many major injuries, but just being the kind of guy I am, I'm kind of, yeah, tall, lanky guy. I do get a lot of niggles, so I've had a bit of trouble just with Achilles, knees, but I've kind of got better, especially since joining Nick at being able to um, listen to your body a bit more um, and also – do those one percenters that's going to try and stop injuries happen. So I think that's definitely helped me over the yeah, last 12 or 24 months um, in regards to trying to stay healthy for major periods of the year. And uh, can you give a specific example of how you've gotten better at listening to your body? Yeah, so I think it's easy when, you, um, when you're when a bit younger. You kind of have a little bit of a niggle and you, you're probably afraid to miss maybe a day or miss a couple of runs. If you've, you're just only a little bit sore, you're probably more inclined to push through it. But these days, if you've now, if I've got a little niggle, I'm happy to. I'll miss a run. I'll miss a day or two of running, um, just because you realise the bigger picture that, yeah, day or two is not going to matter um, at all um, compared to if you do get a bad injury from trying to push through it. Um, it's going to make a big difference for how you perform in the season. So, it's kind of just a bit wiser. You're kind of looking bigger picture instead of just short term trying to um, focus on just making sure you're hitting all what you want to do in training, etc. You're listening to dual Australian 10,000 metre champion Stewie Mack sharing on his highs, lows and learnings of his career to date. Support for today's show comes from the Gold Coast Marathon. Just like the physical performance show, the Gold Coast Marathon encourages runners of all ages and abilities to push their boundaries and strive to complete a personal challenge. The Gold Coast Marathon is held annually on the first weekend in July and is a must-do event for any budding athlete, weekend warrior, or family looking for a challenge to complete together. Run for the good times at the Gold Coast Marathon. Visit goldcoastmarathon.com. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to 
complete their rehabilitation, get back to their physical best, and in doing so, cross their physio finish line. In addition to traditional session-to-session appointments, we also offer some unique and very popular fixed fee rehabilitation services, including our monthly wellness booster packs, where from a low $197 health fund rebatable per month, you can access physiotherapy, active rehabilitation services, including exercise physiology, clinical Pilates, and use of -of state-of-the-art equipment, such as the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill, Normatec recovery boots, and the Nord board. To find out more about Pogo Physio Services or to schedule your one-hour initial comprehensive appointment, be sure to jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now, let's jump back with this week's feature performer, Stuart McSwain, on his highs, lows, and learnings from his running career to date. Stu... uh in terms of outsiders looking in, we hear of your times, you know, 1305, 5,000 metres, uh, 335, 1,500 metre indoor, you know, going through in a low 220, 1,000 metre split. And, it, you know, to a, a mere mortal runner, the mind boggles. Uh, and we just attribute it to mega talent, like you did, I guess, prior to uh, connecting yourself with some, some peers there at Melbourne Track Club. But can you put us in broad brushstrokes of what a typical training week would look like for you in terms of structure obviously your load's been adjusted through the year depending on championship preparations etc but what does a sort of typical week look like for Stewie McSqueen yeah so it's pretty simple most of my weeks are um, pretty similar yeah unless I'm in racing season then you obviously cut it back a little bit so pretty much on a Monday I'll do two runs so I do a 50 or 60 minute run in the morning and then a short run at night Um, Tuesday I'll do a track workout or just a simple eight eight by 1k longer reps, um, gym during the day and then another run at night. Um, Wednesday I'll do two easy runs. Um, Thursday I'll do a threshold run. So that's, we have, we probably do about nine K at heart rate. Um, or it it can vary depending on the time of season. Um, another run in the Arvo and then Friday I'll just do a really light, light jog. Um, that's kind of my recovery day. Um, and then Saturday we'll do hill reps or, threshold work in the morning and then i'll do another run and then sunday is just the single training session i'll do um a long run so that can vary from 90 minutes to two hours if i'm trying to get ready for a 10k yeah and i got it so that's the that's the general structure and i mean uh mileage or volume which isn't everything but just to put us in perspective you know what does that sort of range from Stu, at the moment this this stage of your career which is still you know the, the formative years in many ways yeah, so I probably run between 150 to 165, 170k, um, depending on the week. Um, what I've kind of found is that's kind of the good balance zone for me, where I can definitely get in good shape training that much. Because I've kind of found if I do too, I start trying to push it too much, I just get too tired, and my sessions aren't as good. Because um, that's probably what I found is that the most important part of me is those three session days. The other days, I just try and get through them easy as I can just recover because yeah if, if I'm pushing those off days or I'm running too far on those off days I kind of it means my sessions aren't as good and that's when I probably probably aren't getting to the level of fitness that I'm aiming to so you'll if I heard correctly this do you'll adjust those off days to make sure you really hit your on days your, your hard days exactly yeah. Stu, uh, before we throw into a performance round and, and pull out some learnings uh, let's just touch on athletic high and athletic low so you know, of all the things you've achieved, Stu, what's what would you rate as your greatest achievement to date? Yeah, probably what I'd say is one of my greatest achievements was the European season I had um, in 2018. I feel like for three and a half months, there wasn't many. There's only really one race where I wasn't at least satisfied with. So probably being away from home, it's never easy. But being able to consistently perform at how to a level close to or above what I was trying to do was um, probably probably the big high for me um, for that three and a half months. And then obviously a homecom games last year was another big one. Just it's not often your family and friends get to watch you on TV or alive and get to watch you. So that was um, also a pretty special moment for me. Stu, uh, what's been the darkest day in your athletic career to date? Yeah. As we mentioned before, I'd probably say the couple of weeks where I had stopped running, um, I'd probably, probably things weren't going as well as I was hoping. Um, and obviously uni started to take over. So probably those three weeks, when it's kind of you're questioning whether you still have 
have the same love for the sport, whether you can prioritize it over other stuff, like hanging out, partying with friends when you're 18. So that was probably the, the toughest those three weeks. But yeah, other than that, I've been lucky. I've got a good support crew. So the, over the last couple of years of running, yeah, I haven't had too many bad days. When you're traveling around the world with mates, it's not too bad. Yeah, no, fantastic. And Stu, just before we throw to this performance round, you know, in terms of athletic prowess, there's, you know, people would look at you and say you're a good runner, but then there's also that delineation about being a good competitor. And uh, I actually threw to your coach before we, re- we pressed record today, and I said, is there anything that you'd specifically feel would be really valuable to, to ask Stuart about. And and your coach, Nick, commented that, you know, ask Stu about the difference between a, being a good runner and a good competitor. So over to you, Stu. Yeah, I think the big thing is at the top level, there's not much difference between ability. The top five at World Champs Olympics, they're all good athletes. They're all um, fit enough to be there at the bell lap. Uh, most of the time it just comes down to who wants it more, who's willing to try and push harder than the other, who's willing to take a risk. And I think that's what you see at a lot of the majors in recent years, you've seen guys be as good as Mo Farah, but probably not have the same competitiveness, willing to make sure they're not getting beat on that day, even if they're not feeling their best. So I think, um, yeah, I think obviously competitiveness and being able to find a way to um, perform, even if you're not feeling your best, is probably pretty key for if you want to be a world-class contender. What do you think drives those that want it more, Stu? A lot of it does come down to self-belief, but I think it's just it's a willingness to refuse to um, – give in like everyone's in pain on that last lap of a race so everyone's hurting but it's just a willingness to push yourself harder not give in um will, yeah obviously makes a big difference when it's when the medals and the winner of races are being decided at the top level so when you're you know running the 5,000 meters there in uh in, in august 2018 it's going to be a uh, the fourth fastest 5,000 meters on the track ever recorded and it's it's a blistering pace What's going through your head, Stu, when, you know, you're redlining, but you know you're on for a PB if you can just stick with it? What's the internal dialogue, dialogue like for Stuart McSqueen at that stage? Yeah, so I was probably thinking, yeah, there's obviously quick. I think I went through in 7.50 through 3K, so I was like, yeah, the pace is on. But um, it's kind of the fo- – I was trying to focus because it's easy to be like, oh, you're going to smash your PB today. You probably don't have to push as hard, but you kind of got to be still thinking that – you never know the chance to run a low 13 or to break 13 might never come again. So I was kind of had that in the back of my head that I was going to give it everything I had um, just because it's easy to kind of think in the future you might get better chances, but you never know if that day is going to come. So if you get get the right moment and you're in it, you got to try and yeah focus on that moment and try and see if you can do it there and then. And obviously uh, you focused on that moment and and, uh, and achieved the result. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So obviously it came together pretty well for that race. Is there times you can reflect on, Stu, where you didn't feel like you're focused on the moment and didn't come together in racing? Yeah, there's definitely races where you're not feeling well It's easy, or you're not, you know you're not going to run a PB or you've, you're having a bad day, you're not going to run a result where it's easy to try and switch off, be thinking about other stuff while you're out there running. But it's kind of those days you've got to, real, you've got to work out what happened there and try and use them to try and make sure it doesn't happen again. So that's why I try and – you try and forget about those bad ones, but you try and also use them to try and make sure, yeah, you, you improve the next time you step out on the racetrack. Is there any one racer that sticks in mind, Stu, as a race that you just look back and go, oh, I learn a lot from that, I don't want to do that again? Yeah, so in my European season last year, I think a big one was um, I raced a 5K in Italy. Um, I was coming off winning the Birmingham MZ Car Mile. So I think the race was five days after, and it was halfway, it was between the Diamond League final and after winning MZ Car. So. I knew I was in shape. I probably thought that I would just be able to walk into the race and perform well, and I had a pretty poor performance. So I kind of knew going to the Brussels 5K Diamond League final, I had to be ready to perform well because I probably, yeah, I probably let it slip after celebrating winning Birmingham too much. So that was kind of where I, I had a bad race, but I was able to use it as a bit of motivation and a learning experience. And then obviously – it paid off about yeah six days later in Brussels in the um, when I ran my thirteen oh five. You're listening to Stewie Mack, Australian Jewel ten thousand meter champion, sharing around the highs, lows, and learnings of his running career to date. If you missed last week's episode, it was an expert edition featuring high-performance consultants to some of the world's leading sporting organizations and teams, including Manchester United and the Chicago Bulls, Dr. Tim Gabbard. Dr. Tim shared around all things load management and why training harder 
may in fact be training smarter. Here's a little snippet of what you missed. Load is um, is essentially the external work that we do. So it could be um, the distance that you run. It could be the weight that you lift. It could be the number of times you throw a ball. That's external load. We then have internal load, which is which is your response to that external work. So it could be the physiological response, for example, your heart rate. It could be your um, psychophysiological response, so your, your perception of effort. It could be your, your biomechanical response, for example, your joint load. And it, it takes into account a whole heap of external factors like stress and sleep and mood and soreness and um, nutrition, hydration. To tune into the full episode featuring Dr. Tim Gale, Abbott, episode 151. Be sure to download the episode and learn away. Whilst there, be sure to check out the archives dating right back to episode 1 featuring Australian surf lifesaving Ironman champion Ali Day. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured performer, Stewie Mack, on all things highs, lows, and learnings from his Bergenin distance running career. Stu, are you ready for the performance round? Yeah, let's go for it. Here we go. Stu McSween, training session you most dislike? Uh, I'd probably have to say short hill reps. How short are we talking? Yeah, probably anything below 400. I just kind of build up with a bit too much lactic and can't recover compared to a, a few of the quicker guys in the squad like Geordie Williams or Ryan Gregson. So, yeah, that's probably the session I definitely probably perform the worst at. <laughs> uh, training session you most love, if that's the one you uh, dislike. Training session you most love? Yeah, I'd probably say um, longer reps, so maybe 8 by one k um, especially when we're back in Melbourne or we're in London at Bushy Park. There's not many better places to train, so I'd probably say, yeah, the longer reps, like 8, one, eight by one k And you're going, you know, you, what sort of rest cycle are you having on those? Yeah, so we normally, we're probably doing reps anywhere between 245 to 255 pace, um, and we'll have 60 seconds recovery between the um, eight or so reps. Yeah, solid. Favorite pre-race meal? What fuels Stewie McSqueen? Yeah, so I always like eating carbs. So it's probably most of my diet. So I'll be making sure I'm eating a lot of bread, cereals, um, pasta as well on the day of a race. And uh, specifically, how far before your event do you like to eat? Uh, I'll probably have a good meal maybe four or five hours before. um, And then I'll snack until the race. I'll have a banana or a couple of muesli bars, maybe two, two and a half hours before um, I'm set to compete. Stu, bedtime and rise time, getting up, what, what's your cycle look like there? Um, so, yeah, I'm generally an early to bed kind of guy. Like I'll, I'm normally out before 11 p.m. most nights because um, I am kind of wake up early. So I'm up probably 6.37 most mornings. So um, kind of is helpful when we do a lot of our training in the morning, um, being able to wake early because it kind of gives you a bit of time where you can obviously sh- – stretch or do any prehab before the session and also you're able to you've got enough time where you can have a good sized breakfast and you know it's not going to come up during the session when especially if you've got a hard workout there must have been times though when it has come up <laughs> uh de- yeah definitely especially when you're a hard training block and you're already going in fatigue um there's definitely moments when yeah you're at your absolute limit yeah <laughs> brilliant uh Stu, who's the athlete that you most admire and why uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I probably say Brett Robertson. He's kind of, um, since I've been, yeah, 18 years old, he's played a big role for me. He's always there if I need to talk, I need advice. Um, he's a pretty selfless guy. Um, if there's anything he could do to help you, he, he'll make sure he does it. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably say he's been the, the biggest guy that's helped me the most um, so far in my senior career. Who's the toughest competitor you've ever raced and why, Stu? Um, I'd probably say, domestically, I'd say Brett Robertson. I think... Whenever you step on the track against him, you know it's going to be a hard run. There's no way that's going to, he's going to leave it to a kick finish. So, you know, it's going to be um, obviously a hard race. But probably another guy I'd say on the international seas, probably Paul Chalimo, um, who's an American guy. Um, he's just a tough competitor. You know, if you, if you do beat him, you know you've had a blinder because there's no way if you're not bringing your A game, you're going to have a chance against him. So, yeah, I'd probably say he's the other guy that is definitely not that easy to race. Stu, is there a mantra that you use when you're racing or you're in one of these hard sessions or some regular self-talk and, and what is it? Um, especially, yeah, probably the big thing when I'm racing is I try and not even, not think about anyone else in the race. It's kind of just focusing on myself. Um, and it's even the same in training. I try and not worry what other people are doing. Um, you kind of just got to focus on yourself. If you're, you're having um, a bad day, especially in training, um, 
not worry if anyone else is having a good day. You kind of got to draw back your your level of training to suit you. So if I'm tired, I'll threshold a bit easier or etc. Um, so it's kind of yeah. The big thing for me is just mainly focus on myself, not on anyone else you're training with or rivals in a race. Just yeah, focus solely on um, what you can do and trying to do the best that you can. Oh, that's great, Stu. Uh, your best recovery tip? What's that? Uh, probably the the big one is me. Uh, um, is just a protein shake. So I'm pretty much after any hard workout, I'll um, have the protein shake ready to have in that first yeah 20 minutes after a session, just to try and especially if you've got another um you've got another training at night, um, try and get that protein in quick so you're recovered and ready to go later in the day if you've got another um session to complete. Brilliant, Stu. One word to describe your racing style. What is it, and why? Uh, I'd probably say. Brave. Um, just because I think there's not many races where I'm I don't have a have a big hard go. I think um, especially in some of the races, it's easy to um, not get on the pace like in Birmingham when the they're obviously going at world record pace. But I think most of the time I'm willing to give it a go. Um, even if I'm racing guys that are a lot better than me, I'm I'm not happy just to hang around the back of races. I'm always trying to be at the front and push the pace. So that's probably. Probably a big thing I try and focus on in my racing to make sure that when I am out there, I feel like I am being a little bit brave and not just sitting back and letting others dictate how the races go. Yeah, I, I like that. That's brilliant. Stu, uh, final few questions in the performance round. You're doing really well. How would you describe Stu being in the zone? Um, probably the big thing, you know you're in the zone, especially in a race. Um, you just, you're not distracted, you know, like you, you have what you want to do in the race. You have your goals. You're probably thinking back to all the hard training you've done leading in and you just your mind's just on making sure you're doing everything to achieve that goal. You're not worried who's on the start line, um, what's going on around you. You kind of just focus, yeah, solely on yourself and trying to execute the best you can. So that's probably the yeah, the big things I notice if I feel that I'm hundred percent in the zone. When was the last time Stu you're in the zone? Probably in that Birmingham race, to be honest. I think um even though I was on the back of the leaders, I kind of didn't really understand the pace I was going. I was kind of just focusing on myself, trying to, um, yeah, trying to not worry how fast the guys in front of me were running. So I think that was probably going through in, yeah, I think I went through 152 in that race maybe, but I didn't even notice just because I was solely focusing on myself. So, yeah, I wasn't even looking at the clock. So that was probably, yeah, the last time I was um, 100% in the zone. Yeah, wow, amazing. And last question, still in the performance round, what's the hardest session Stuart McSween has ever done? Yeah, so this is a pretty easy one. I remember, so I was in a training camp in Spain in 2018. Um, it was about three weeks out from going to a bat diamond league where I, I ran the three, uh, 3K there. I ran my PB, 7.34. But I remember the session, I think it was 20 by 400, uh, maybe starting at 69 second, 400 pace. Um, and oh, Actually, sorry, it must have been 67. With the next rep, 65. The next rep, 62, last rep, 59, five sets of that um, with diminishing recovery. So we might have started with a minute 30 at the start, then down to a minute, then down to 30 seconds. And I remember thinking when I got to the last four reps, I'm, I'll, I was hoping I'd be able to finish the session, but I, was getting, I honestly might fall over and die on the track here. <laughs> um, it was probably – it was at altitude. It was 25 degrees heat. And, yeah, honestly, I, I was able to complete the session, but I don't remember a lot of the last rep. Uh, last four reps, um, to be honest. So it obviously showed how hard it was. I remember across, I remember at the finish, after I'd finished, I was just lying on the ground in pain for about five minutes. So that's, yeah, without the hardest session I've done. That's brilliant. And that was one of uh, your coach Nick's creations, was it? Yeah, it definitely would have been. I'm, I'm not sure what how many times he's used it in the past, but it was a good, con- it's definitely a good confidence boosting session because it got me ready to go for, yeah, Rabat in the couple weeks' time. Yeah, no, brilliant. Stu, you're out of the performance round. Final few questions coming at you. If you could boil everything you've ever learnt through your career to date, Stu, into one piece of advice, just a single piece of advice to help people tuning in who are looking to perform at their own physical best do so, what would it be? What's your one bit of advice, Stu? Yeah, I'd probably say the big thing for me is you've got to, um, you've got, I think, um, whether you're a recreational runner or you're a competitive runner, you're going to have people telling you that you're not good enough, people telling you um, telling you you're doing things wrong or et cetera. You, there's always going to be negative negative advice around you, but it's kind of you just got to have that 
in a self belief that no matter what people say, um, you're going to be able to perform. So in more of a competitive sense, it's when you got into races in bad form, you'll hear a lot of people saying you're not going to run well, you're in poor form. You kind of just got to be able to block out any negativity and just have that deep self belief that you know you can you're going to be able to perform well, you're going to be able to do it. So I think that's the big, big thing. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the sport is um, physical, but a lot of it does come down to that mental side and having that that belief is obviously in yourself is pretty huge. So there's a, the word again, Stu, belief and. You know, it, it ties in with what's the relationship with, you know, brave. You described your racing style as brave and going for it, which anyone that knows your racing style would attest to. What do you think is the, the correlation between being brave and, and belief? Yeah, I think it's pretty big, um, really, because you've got to be able to um, have that self-belief that you know you can do stuff that people aren't expecting you to do, whether that's go to the front in a race or et cetera. So I think um, having that self-belief definitely aids you being able to put in action that kind of um, brave mentality. Yeah, no, that's terrific. And what comes first? You know, it's a cycle, isn't it? Yeah, definitely um, self-belief comes first. I think it's um, definitely probably the most important, one of the most important things you can have um, because, yeah, without it, you're probably not going to perform at the level you want to. Yeah. Stu, uh, personality question. Every guest uh, gets asked, Three people at a dinner table, living or past, who's at Stuart McSween's table and why? A bit of a fun one. Yeah, so probably the three guys um, I'd go with is obviously one would be Brett Robertson just because he's had such a big involvement. Um, he's one of my best mates. I train with him most days, so I'd definitely lock in him. Uh, another guy would be another Aussie distance runner, Matt Ramsden. Um, he's definitely probably, yeah, one of my best mates as well, but – I do a lot of my training with him. We room a lot on training camp, so I'd invite him. And the final one would probably be Nick Rewalt. So I'm a big St. Kilda fan growing up. Um, Rui was my idol, the big, tall, blonde guy uh, on the field. So he kind of, yeah, it was a big idol for me growing up, and I'd probably have to have him as the third member on the table. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, funny, Nick Rewalt was my first year chemistry uh, buddy who got me through chemistry, Stu. Without Nick's involvement, I wouldn't have passed that, that subject and wouldn't have gone on to finish my degree. So uh, so there's a little bit of trivia for you. Um, so uh, Nick Rewalt's at the table. Stewie, uh, I've got to ask you this. I've been curious about this ever since I've been following, you know, your posts on Instagram. Uh, hashtag bean, beans ing it. I don't even know if that's the right way to pronounce it. I don't know if you're at liberty to share what that means or if it's an internal thing that it's just for yourself and your teammates, but what's that one about? Yeah, so um, yeah, it's pretty good pronunciation. So the hashtag's beansing it. Um, it kind of, when I was at school, I had a maid in school who would always say, if a, if a circumstance was pretty, um, pretty relaxed or chill, they would say beans. And it kind of just, um, yeah, kind of formed into beansing it. And then I kind of just did it on my first Instagram post as a joke. Obviously, I was new to Instagram. I'm probably 18 or 19 and used the hashtag. And then I was like, when I did my second post, I was like, oh, maybe I'll have that again. And it kind of just went from there. I ha- started using it every post. Um, so, yeah, I've, I think all of my posts, I don't know how many posts I've done on Instagram, maybe 100, all of them have beans in it now because it's kind of just a thing I do. Um, and it, a few people, I get a fair few messages, people asking about it. But, yeah, pretty much beans in it just is pretty rela- laid back, relaxed term for if um yeah you're pretty easy going or situations pretty relaxed and easy going i am so pleased to now know and i've discovered uh the, the background on that hashtag uh would you describe yourself as laid back Stu? pretty relaxed yeah in a sense i think growing up in the country on a farm you kind of um are a relaxed person um i'm probably less relaxed um over the last couple of years just because my life obviously is a bit more full on now. I'm trying to balance uni and running, but yeah, I'd say generally I'm a pretty relaxed guy. Stu, uh, another curiosity question. You mentioned that your brother, you believe, has a big engine. Clearly, you've got a huge engine. Uh, have you ever had, and I suspect you have, and share if you like, and I understand if you don't want to put it in the public domain, but your VO2 max assessed? Yeah, I'm not sure what it is. Um, to be honest, I haven't really had it properly tested, but I think, yeah, I think, it would be pretty high just because I'm obviously probably strong. But, yeah, I'm honestly not sure. Yeah, no, certainly. Uh, well, we could all assume that it's a, an enormous, enormous figure. Stu, uh, every guest of the show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week. So what's Stuart McSween's physical challenge 
of the week going to be for listeners? Uh, I just think that my physical challenge will be um, to try and get out for that extra ride, extra run, whatever, uh, one more time for the week. I think it's like uh, when I run with my bro, he tries to, he normally does two or three runs a week, but when I'm back in Melbourne, I'm probably getting about doing four or five. So I think that's why he gets a lot fitter when I'm um, back training with him. So I think if you can get out and do that one extra run, one extra ride, it will um, make a big difference to your fitness if you're able to do that week in, week out. So just adding one extra run in addition to what you're already doing. Yeah. Brilliant. Stu, uh, finally here, a few rapid fire questions. Finish this sentence. The most important thing in life is? I'd probably say family. What drives you to work hard, Stu? Probably goals and motivation to try and achieve what you think you you have the ability to do. Where does pressure come from? Um, I'd say internal and external, but I'd say the most most important one is um, in, internal pressure to try and force you to achieve your goals. And finally, Stu, what mistakes are you afraid of making? Probably the big one is not learning from past mistakes, really. Um, not using a mistake to try and fuel extra motivation or try and improve in some way. So that's probably the big one. Uh, brilliant. Stewie McSween, thank you for your time today. You have a, a wealth of... Uh, of learnings and uh, an inspiration to share share with us. So thank you. And uh, uh, what's next for Stuart McSween? So my next big race will be World Cross Country at the end of March. So we've got a good Australian team. So we'll, we'll be looking to try and see if we can sneak on the team medal tally there. So that would be um, obviously a great result, but it's obviously going to be hard when you've got powerhouse nations, Ethiopia, Uganda, um, Kenya. But I think the six guys we've got on the team are all high-quality athletes. And I think there's no reason if we all get it right, we can't medal so that will be the golf um the goal coming up for me yeah brilliant and Stu, if people want to follow your journey where's best to uh track along yeah so probably the best would just be on instagram um i try and share if anything big happens i'll make a post and chuck up a, a photo so just at stewie underscore mac three um you can grab me on instagram uh, brilliant Stu mcswain all the best for the uh remainder of the year awesome thanks a lot for having me brad So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show, and I trust you enjoyed hearing from Stewie Mack, this week's guest, around his highs, lows, and learnings of his running career to date. If you did, then be sure to let Stewie know, and also myself, you can tag us over on Instagram at Stewie underscore Mac, M-A-C-3, the number three, and at Brad underscore Beer. Of course, there's a show handle on Instagram at Physical Performance Show. And be sure to let us know what it is that you enjoyed or learnt from Stewie's share-ins. A good way to do that is with the Podsy. That's simply a screenshot of the episode that you've been enjoying and tagging the show in at Physical Performance Show and captioning what it is that you've been enjoying from the show and what it is that you're doing whilst you are downloading the learnings. Might be out running, doing the chores, or even on public transport. A huge thanks to those that have been leaving reviews and ratings over on iTunes for the Physical Performance Show. A big shout out this week to Damien Stride. Damien rated the show five stars and commented, Since finding this podcast, I constantly check my phone daily to see if there is another new episode to listen to. I take away learnings from every interview to not only better myself as an athlete, but also as a person. The amazing stories inspire me and really put things into perspective, and that was especially evident after listening to Clint Kimmons' story. Keep up the great work. Damien, thank you for taking the time to leave that review. And as a little way of saying thank you, be sure to get in touch, b.beer at pogophysio.com.au, and we'll get a copy of the revised and expanded edition of You Can Run Pain-Free out to you in the post. Massive thanks also for those of you who have been hitting subscribe. If you have enjoyed more than four episodes, that is the threshold where if you've enjoyed four or more, please hit subscribe. It'll ensure that each episode lands with you each and every week. And it also really is the greatest way for this show to reach a greater audience and more earbuds. So thank you in advance for hitting subscribe if you have enjoyed more than four episodes. Big thanks to the three very good folk who make this show possible week in, week out. That's Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, and Matthew Walding on all things graphic design. 
Another massive thank you to the Gold Coast Marathon for supporting this week's episode. If you are looking for a great mid-year challenge, go no further than the Gold Coast Marathon. It is one of my favorite events on the calendar each and every year. And there is an event from everyone, ranging from the junior dash right through to the full-length marathon. Jump over to goldcoastmarathon.com.au. If you're into running, and I suspect you may be after listening to today's episode, and you'd like to get your hands on my running bestseller, You Can Run Pain-Free, now in its revised and expanded edition, be sure to use the promo code over at pogophysio.com.au to receive 50% off your hardcover book by using the promo code POGO, that's capital P-O-G-O, 2019, the numerics, 2019, POGO, 2019. And coming up on next week's episode, episode 153 of the Physica Performance Show, I'll bring you an expert edition on all things running shoes, featuring two of the world's preeminent sports podiatrists, Paul Griffin and Simon Bartold. Simon Bartold's bio is really like few others in the world of sports medicine, in particular podiatry. Simon has been a sports podiatrist at four Olympic Games. In 2014, he was the consultant podiatrist of the Port Power in the Australian Football League. He's been an editorial board member for the Journal of Science and Medicine in Sport in the Australasian Physiotherapy Journal. He's a well-credentialed and revered biomechanist and researcher. He's also been the consultant podiatrist at the Australian Institute of Sport, Cricket Academy, the British Cricket Academy, and the Indian cricket team. There's very little that Simon Bartold hasn't done in the world of podiatry and his colleague Paul Griffin both an also remarkable professional bio. And on next week's episode we pull the running shoe apart. We explore recent trends. We look at the best ways to determine the right shoe for you. What sticks and what doesn't. We talk about the future of shoe manufacturing. It's a real deep dive into all things running shoe related so be sure to be tuning in next week to that expert edition and freeway chat with Paul Griffin and Simon and Bartold. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show.